Several Vancouver problems date back to 1973, when the first chief planner, Gerald Sutton Brown, was fired by a new political party called Team, a move opposed by Cope's Harry Rankin and media editorials which called him one of the most intelligent decision makers in the city's history. Sutton Brown's priority was housing to keep prices low. He converted the West End from houses to high rises, supported the Vancouver Special for large immigrant families, and sprinkled density throughout the city. He wanted a working city, responsive to market forces. Team brought a diverse set of progressive ideas with some negative consequences that affect us to this day. Prevent more West Ends, preserve single family neighborhoods, push growth outside the city. Their livable region strategy would direct immigrants and the young towards higher density suburban centers pushed by high house prices. With workers displaced to the suburbs, their jobs land would be converted to high density housing. Development fees paid by the new residents, not existing taxpayers, would pay for high priced amenities. The new model rejects the city's natural density gradient. The regional plan works against the actual job market of a working city. Sutton Brown had supported 100 townhouses on the west side. Team went all the way to the Supreme Court to rezone them back to houses. Sutton Brown opposed housing on unhealthy major streets. His West End has only one or two stories of commercial. Today, despite medical research, dense housing is put only on busy streets, where new residents serve as buffers for noise and pollution. Hastings was economically vibrant. Chinatown was the go-to place for evening entertainment. A survey showed no people lying on the street. But in 1973, the demolition of half the city's SROs began, ending when street homelessness appeared a decade later. That same year, the city sponsored a federal grant to hire advocates and helped them incorporate the Downtown Eastside Residents Association. This was the first time the public heard the words Downtown Eastside. Whereas Sutton Brown had dispersed low-income housing throughout healthy mixed neighborhoods, the vulnerable casualties of rising house prices were drawn by free housing and services into the newly named neighborhood, the waiting drug trade, and tragedy for thousands. If government had not intervened, would low-income residents have dispersed naturally, like all other Canadian cities? More than half of today's rental apartments were built under Sutton Brown. Only 15% have been built in the five decades since he was fired. Under Sutton Brown, Granville Street and Chinatown had the second highest density of neon signs after Shanghai. A sanitizing 1974 bylaw sent them to the museum. BC Tel Telus's landmark head office downtown was sent outside the city boundary. Sutton Brown tried to legalize basement suites. Shaughnessy was full of inexpensive rooming houses. Zoning enforcement removed hundreds of low-income workers and seniors. New bylaws ended the Vancouver Special, and a new provincial government cancelled what would have been our tallest building. It was laid on its side where it takes up three blocks. Despite reports by economists and industry warning of rising house prices, new processes were introduced to slow housing. Home builders had to erect large warning signs, advertise, send mass mailouts, rent space for opposition groups to organize. Public hearings were moved to the evening, raising overtime costs. Intimidated councils added expensive, time-consuming requirements. Public hearings were mostly landowners who benefited from obstructing housing. By preventing homes for others, they increased the value of their houses, tax-free windfall profits, paid for by crushing mortgages on the young, while vilifying developers who built the houses they lived in. Under Sutton Brown, only large areas could be rezoned. Today, rezoning is one building at a time. 
builders could meet all departments for approvals in one place every week. Now they have to make their own separate appointments. The new processes worked. Most low density areas have less population today than in 1973. Others have grown hardly at all. This massive de-densification happened while thousands of smaller homes were demolished, replaced with larger ones with fewer people, causing house prices to skyrocket. But in 1974, the city instead began to blame Asian foreign buyers. Today, only 5% can afford to buy those houses, protected since 1973. Sutton Brown was planning thousands of homes, Harbour Park with 15 towers of guaranteed rental, a seawall to Stanley Park. Instead, the city bought the land using five years of park funds for the east side. With no development to cover costs, this rarely used park has a poor quality walkway and surface parking lot. Project 200 would connect Gastown over the rail yards to the waterfront, doubling downtown office space with thousands of new homes. This too was cancelled. In North Falls Creek, construction for 1973 was cancelled, though the plans look similar to what was built decades later. Sutton Brown's projects were connected to the street grid, good transit, homes with views, high density to support quality amenities, flexible for future needs not master planned, and no subsidies. The new approach was Falls Creek South, an anti-West End. Poor connection to the street grid, little transit, densities too low to support retail, housing looking inward, not outward, social housing ratio large, but total small, and millions in subsidies from all three levels of government. A freeway was proposed through the industrial lands in Grandview Cut to get commuters off East Vancouver streets. A referendum approved a new Georgia viaduct demolishing one block called Hogan's Alley, displacing mostly Chinese, but also Italians, Eastern and Western Europeans, and two black households. But linking the freeway to a third crossing was controversial. Sutton Brown had called the downtown freeway a drastic measure at a drastic price, and cautioned citizens would likely not support it. The federal and provincial governments had decided against funding, but during the 1969 election, the NDP revived it. The two team councillors proposed a tunnel under Thurlow, exit, then connect back to the viaduct. The team downtown freeway option failed. The NDP lost the election and the freeway died and was not in team's 1970 or 1972 platforms. Vancouver has swung between the UK model, incremental, resilient, and the US model, rigid, unresponsive. For almost 50 years, Vancouver used the self-organizing UK model, building a dynamic, resilient, working city. Then US planner Harlan Bartholomew brought the US system zoning. Gerald Sutton Brown brought a partial return, but team swung hard to the US with serious consequences, squeezing out working people in jobs land, depopulating single house neighborhoods, increasing sprawl, thus greenhouse gases, driving up house prices, creating enormous inequities. Why is housing so expensive? Free markets have made the materials more affordable and the labor more productive. But land, controlled by government planning, prevents the market from working. The reason young people cannot afford housing. The UK system is resilient. Markets respond quickly to correct problems. The less wealthy can outcompete the wealthy by consuming less space. The US system requires expensive, time-consuming plans, and it's controlled by forces that benefit from rising house prices. Its very purpose is to prevent competition by under-consuming. Could we be on the verge of a return to the UK model and a resilient, affordable, working city? <laughs>